Good morning. I'm going to uh, introduce you today to the Stock Market Challenge, uh, which is a great in-class uh, stock market simulation. Uh, quick overview, it's a 10-week game uh, played in both semesters. Uh, it is a game that uh, allots $100,000 to each group. Uh, the groups can, of course, be individual students or can be groups of students. And they have the opportunity to invest in uh, the stock market, bonds, mutual funds, index funds, and I believe even commodities uh, as well um, throughout this 10-week period. It's a competition in which like uh, grade students will compete against each other in different regions around the state of Florida. And I'll show you all of, all of that in a minute. Uh, there are prizes to be won. At the end of the period, um, I believe that unless things change, it'll be a, a Amazon gift cards for the winners. And it's also, more importantly, a great educational tool to introduce kids to investing, get them excited about it. Uh, I have been doing it uh, myself for many decades. And uh, I can't tell you the countless number of students that have chased me down the hall uh, wanting to know how they could do this in their real world, in their real life. So uh, I highly recommend this. Uh, there are some qualifications and so forth and some some uh, caveats that we want to be aware of. But uh, all in all, it's a, it's a fantastic tool. Strongly recommend it. I'm going to begin sharing my screen with you and for the Florida Stock Market Challenge. It is floridasms.com. And this will be the place that you will go immediately to sign your students up. So you see the big red button there in the middle of the screen, the middle of the picture. Uh, you want to click on that. And it will open up to a form that you will need to fill out. Uh, the first thing that you want to take notice of, of course, is that you are signing up for the simulation that you intend to be signing up for. So if you're playing the fall version of the stock market challenge, then this is exactly what you want to see. Uh, this is also the place that you would come if you were going to play the budget game, uh, which will be another uh, training that I will do uh, today. I'm actually doing it later today. Hopefully you've signed up. And if you're interested in, in signing that up, your students are for that, then you would uh, click the drop down menu and you would highlight FCE budget game fall to 2022. Okay, but today we're here to talk about the stock market challenge. Uh, you will create your own username. It can be something as simple as, as your, your name. Uh, it can be, of course, uh, something more flamboyant if you wish. Uh, you will type in a password that will be unique to you. Uh, confirm that password. Uh, for some reason, they want to know that you're year of birth. And uh, you, it's important to put in an email address, of course, because as soon as you finish this form, all of the uh, logins and passwords for your students will be delivered almost immediately to that email address. Below is your registration form as the teacher. So you put in your name, your last name, the school name, the address, city of the school, uh, where the school is located, zip code, uh, phone number, and, you know, I, anybody still has a fax and so you can ignore that. Below that is a line where you can put in a unique username. So for instance, if you want to call yourself the you know the stock monsters or something or or uh, the investment um, idiosyncratics, it's completely up to you. Uh, and what, but once you establish that prefix, every one of the student groups will have that prefix and then the number, say one, number two, number three, number four, number five, whatever the number is in terms of the number of groups that you form. So um, it can be something as simple as your name or it can be something um, a little bit more creative. The next line uh, asks you to indicate how many students are gonna play the game. So if you have 150 students, if you've got five classes of 30 kids, uh, then you would type in 150. The number of teams uh, 
could be 150, in which you come up with uh, logins and passwords for each individual student. Or as I have done um, pretty much throughout most of my career, I created teams, meaning multiple kids, two, three, maybe even four kids in a group. Um, and therefore you would not need as many uh, logins. So you make the decision. I know that of course during COVID we had no choice but to uh, assign this to an individual student. But now that we're back together, you may want the kids to work in groups. Uh, it's, it's completely up to you. So the number of students would be the total number that you have. The number of teams could be the same number or it could be some um, number divided by the, the size of the team. So two, three, four. If you, if you have three kids on a team, you know, then, then you would have 50 numbers, 50 logins for 150 students. You make that decision. The next uh, box is really important because, as I indicated, this is a competition. So you want to make sure that you're competing in your region. Uh, if I drop down, you will see that um, there are six regions. Panhandle, of course, is a panhandle. First Coast is the area around Jacksonville and um, St. Augustine. Central Florida would be the Orlando region. Gulf Coast is, as you might imagine, would be central. So that would be Tampa and all the way up to, you know, maybe the Big Bend area, down to Manatee County and so forth. Uh, Atlantic Coast is going to be Palm Beach County, out to the lake and north up to, say, Brevard County. And then South Florida is going to be um, Broward, Dade, Monroe, uh, as well as, I believe, Collier uh, on the Naples side and so forth. Uh, if you're not sure, if you, if, you, you know, if, if you think you're in the panhandle, but you're not sure, you leave the panhandle in the box and then you drop here and then you can see all of the counties that are considered part of the panhandle region. All of them are part of the panhandle. You would highlight your, your district and then, then move on. Uh, if you are, if you believe that you are part of the Central Florida region, then you again would take a look at what counties are included in the Central Florida region and so forth. Uh, and again, very important because uh, I can't tell you the number of times in which uh, we have been uh, reviewing the results at the end of the game to determine who wins prizes. And we find that somebody has been um, mislocated and in the wrong region. And so they may have done really well in their region, uh, but they move into another region that was really supercharged in terms of their results. And all of a sudden, when they're in their right region, they are not a prize winner. So please make sure that you are, that you're very uh, careful about placing yourself in the correct region, the correct region. Um, let us know if you're a Title I school or not. Um, what subject are you using this in? I would imagine it would be in a Finlit or an econ course, but it doesn't have to be. Um, I've had people in human geography use it. It's a great, great resource to talk about trade and global trade and, and um, so forth. It's, it, it can be used in a variety of, of classes and under a variety of subjects. Uh, another important thing to make sure that you are in the right grade level, because as I indicated, um, elementary kids will be competing against elementary kids, middle school against middle school, high school against high school. So you don't want to misplace yourself there either. So make sure that you're clear. I uh, don't have to make any comments. And then you click register. And as I indicated, very quickly, you'll receive at the email address that you designated the, the logins and the passwords uh, that you that you would then disseminate to your students, and you would get them going in the process. All right, so that's that's the sign up portion of it. That's the sign up portion. All right, so let me um, let me run over. To, I'm going to stop sharing this for a second. We'll we'll come back when I show you how to manipulate the site. But um, let us go to a quick little PowerPoint slide deck presentation. It's going to talk a little bit more about the rules, okay, on and how you how you play the game. Uh -huh. All right. So investing isn't easy. 
that's that's the key. But you know, we we want the kids to get excited about it. Uh, I will tell you from a personal standpoint, uh, when I started doing this game back in the late '80s, uh, I didn't know much at all about stocks, and I, and consequently, I I didn't have a lot of my money invested in them. Um, and, you know, so I was procrastinating, missing out on uh, all of the benefits of starting young. Uh, but as I started teaching the game, I became incredibly passionate about it. And now it's something that I, that I consider, um, you know, a really big part of my life and make it a priority to, uh, to keep track of my investments and to, and to do it right. So um, not only will this hopefully excite your students, but it could absolutely get you supercharged about uh, taking care of your own personal financial situation as well. So, um, as always, this is an educational tool, and we want we want some lessons to be learned here. Uh, again, investing early, you know, recognizing that the that the earlier that you start, the less you have to do. And of course, the magic of compounding cannot be fully realized if you don't take you know the timing advantage. Uh, of starting early, uh, because so much more money can be generated over time if you start early and you continue to invest uh, and you continue to roll your earnings back into your investments and you stay disciplined to the process. So investing early. We want to teach about diversification. Don't put all your eggs into one basket and the importance of that. We want to teach about, you know, have the kids understand all of their uh, asset choices. You know, all of the different classes of assets from uh, the most conservative things uh, to some of the more risky and challenging things. So not only, of course, can you invest in stocks, but we want them to be familiar with index funds, mutual funds, um, and uh, as well as, you know, CDs uh, and mar uh, money, money market accounts. Um, you know, but also, I'm sure you'll do a unit on NFTs. And you'll do a unit on collectibles and you'll talk about, uh, you know, all the new um, cyber currencies and things that are out there. So um, th these we want them to understand their choices. Cryptocurrencies, it's cryptocurrency. Um, this is an interesting uh, thing. You know, I, I of course, uh, in the beginning, um, you know, I would teach kids, all right, hey, you're 18, you could. You know, you have a huge time horizon ahead of you. You you have, you know, if you can find the next Netflix, the next Google, the next Home Depot, um, invest in it when it's a fledgling company and wait and be patient and watch your investment grow and watch your investment expand, you know, uh, that, that, you know, you can absolutely take advantage of your long time horizon and benefit from a gross stock. But increasingly, I, I see the merit of um, invest in income stocks as well. And the beauty of watching yourself make money while you sleep. So what we talk about past investing, talking about earning money through prim primarily dividends, income, income paying stocks, um, different things like REITs, uh, BDCs, and uh, and those types of investments that pay significant dividends, uh, which become an income stream. So um, I have in, in more recent years, you know, spent as much time talking about the benefits of income stocks and, and passive income streams uh, compared to what you would imagine you would be teaching young people about growth stocks and looking for that next really explosive stock that will really appreciate over time. So active versus passive. Uh, of course, we want them to understand because it's only a matter of a few years before they're in the work world and they want to understand what a 401k is. They never want to pass up free money. They want, of course, to be fully versed in their options because, again, passing this up means a really challenging retirement. And we know as adults that um, nothing in the future is guaranteed, and that is especially true uh, in the current generation who may or may not have Social Security, may or may not have a pension. Uh, you know, it's tough to, the, the, the housing market is so much more volatile than it ever was before. 
um, you know, and expensive. So you got to take advantage of things that are put right in front of you. Uh, and a 401k is, is a good example. Okay. All right. Um, we want them to understand that uh, my mantra has always been, you know, pay yourself first. Think about yourself and your savings as if it were a bill. And you should, if you work hard for your money, your money should work hard for you. So invest frequently, invest early, invest often. Okay, and uh, that of course might mean some sacrifices. Yes, there's no question about it. Um, there, there are always trade-offs, and it is even more the case nowadays um, with the high cost of necessities like rent and health insurance and transportation and education, that it is even more of a challenge to save and invest money than ever before. So it will require trade-offs. It will require um, uh, it will require sacrifices. Okay, it will require the 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 need to um, avoid and and to uh, you know deny yourself immediate gratification and be patient for the delayed. So these are things that we really have to drive home. And then um, ultimately, if you stay committed, um, you'll have a happy ending. That's, uh, you know, obviously we can never say that past performance is any complete guarantee of what the future will hold. But um, it, this is a formula that has rarely, rarely failed people, rarely failed people. Um, again, using myself as an example, I started teaching in the 80s um, and I began investing in my future in the early 90s. Uh, but. I took a whack in the um, dot-com bubble burst in 2000. Took another whack in my earnings in the 2008 housing, seven, eight housing crisis. Took another whack in my earnings uh, with, the, with the COVID crash. Uh, you know, I've seen some pretty significant dips in my investment experience, but uh, holding the fort, buying, you know, what happens when uh, stocks collapse? The price falls down and all of a sudden you've got these unbelievably great companies selling at slashed prices. Take advantage of it. Um, when everybody else is running for the hills and selling and selling, that's when you should be lapping them up. So we want to teach these things to the kids. Uh, it is a long-term commitment. It is uh, it, it behooves them to, to really ignore the short-term noise and stay dedicated and committed to their plan. All right, so uh, here are the dates for the game. Um, you'll notice that there is a first semester game and a second semester game. Registration for the, for the SMC has already been open for a while. Uh, and uh, the registration will close on October 7th, and I'll tell you the significance of that date in a minute. Um, thus, within that period of time, uh, between August 1st and September 9th, you can use that for practice. So if you if you have an opportunity a day in which you can let the kids uh, just get on the site and practice buying and selling and and looking for, at their portfolio and and taking advantage of some of the uh, research links and so forth, uh, you can do that during the practice period because on September 12th when the tournament begins for real, all of that practice activity will be wiped away. Everybody will be back to square one. Uh, starting with their $100,000, and the games will begin. The game runs for 10 weeks, as you can see. It ends right before Thanksgiving. And uh, shortly after that is when we will, we will tabulate the results. Uh, on November 18th, whatever resides in the student's portfolio will be liquidated, and uh, the overall values will be calculated, and then the winners will be determined. Uh, and then there's a second game in the spring uh, for your second semester econ or, or Finland students. Okay, again, you're competing throughout the state. You're competing for prizes. Uh, the best portfolio performance uh, over a 10 week period uh, has the opportunity to win. Uh, and unless things change, it's going to be Amazon gift cards, Amazon gift cards. Okay, so um, I already alluded to the fact that once you sign up, you're going to get logins and passwords. Each team will have its own 
unique login and password. Um, you can, as I indicated, create single student teams or groups of students. The game is 10 weeks and the uh, students need to show activity early on. Okay, um, and, and I'll tell you specifically when we get to the rules, but uh, we, we want, you know, the game only serves its purpose if people play it. So, you know, we've kind of created a, a deadline and incentive for the kids to get into it. Okay, I suggest that you spend a, at least a, a couple of class periods teaching about stocks, of course, and you're going to be speaking Swahili to some people who have no idea what a stock is or how the stock market works. And then uh, spend at least one day, and, and maybe, you'll, maybe you'll have the opportunity on the first day of the competition on September 12th uh, to um, go to the computer lab at your school or use the devices in your classroom and the kids can, uh, can work on their building their portfolios right then under your guidance uh, and hopefully buy a stock on that first day and, and get, yeah, get the ball rolling. This is not a simulation that you need to check in on very, with great frequency. Uh, I understand that, that you know, your plate is full, you have so much to teach, uh, and that's the beauty of this game because once you get them going uh, and they understand that they have deadlines to hit, they have to buy stocks, they need to spend their money, uh, that you know the game is uh, self runs. I mean, it it is the kids should be you know self sustaining. And um, when I show you the site, you'll have the opportunity to look at their portfolios and to track their activity and see if they're meeting the goals that you've set. Uh, but again, it's not something that you need to do. I mean, if you have the freedom in your schedule to have a investment Friday every week, good for you, but you don't have to do that. So um, once the game is established, once the kids understand the rules, once they understand the, um, the, the requirements, uh, then, then they, can, they can definitely handle this on their own. Um, I, I indicated to you, of course, that there is a, potentially a great amount of excitement, but we want, you know, th there is a ca caveat here. I mean, th this is a 10-week game. It's a 10-week competition. Kids are trying to make as much money as they possibly can. Chances are the winner of the competition is going to throw as much money as they can into one stock that takes off like a rocket. Um, and that, of course, is not realistic, right? I mean, we want, in real life, we want people to invest uh, across many sectors. We want them to diversify their, their asset classes. We want them to, um, to continuously, you know, I mean, take advantage of index funds and, 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 um, and mutual funds. And, and, of course, those two things are not going to win you this game because, again, you need in order to win this game, you need something that's just going to take off like a rocket. And, and what I've just described tend to be more slow, gradual, lifetime uh, growth things. You know, very rewarding, but very limited amount of volatility. So we need to continue to teach kids this is a game. It's not real life. This, you know, the strategies to win this game are not the strategies that we want you to use when you are investing for yourself, okay? Uh, and that typically it is very, very difficult to buy low and sell high a particular stock. And not that it doesn't happen, but it is, it's, it's very challenging. Always risky to put so much and too much of your hard-earned cash into one thing. Um, so many of us in the 1990s this strange thing came along called the internet. This strange suffix called dot com came along and we were like, holy cow, this is the next best thing to slice bread and we're gonna throw all our money in here because how could it possibly go wrong? Okay, everybody one day will be online. Everybody will be buying and shopping and, and working and, and no one will ever have to put on pants because you can just work from your, from your bedroom. And so we invested way too much money, okay, overloaded on dot-com stocks. 
And so a lot of people that invested in the 1990s took a serious whack when the bubble burst and those uh, dot-com companies, you know, trashed. And so many of them disappeared. Um, I would say the same thing was true in housing. Too many people invested too much money into housing, houses they couldn't afford. And again, so much wealth was lost when the housing bubble burst. So we want to teach slow. We want to teach um, meticulous. We want you know to teach strategies that will create a long-term plan to financial success. Thus, the game is fun. The game has its merits, but it also kind of has, can convey some bad habits. So we want to continuously remind the students uh, of, of, of the difference. All right, the uh, game is played entirely online at that website that I showed you earlier. Student portfolios can be accessed 24-7 at floridasms.com. Uh, every student team begins with $100,000. Uh, and you will be investing for 10 weeks. Uh, nothing has to be done at the end of the 10 weeks. Your portfolios will be liquidated and uh, values determined. Uh, it's almost realistic, almost real-time uh, pricing, uh, slight delay, um, and then bonds and mutual funds uh, will get end-of-the-day pricing. Uh, one element of the game that they have yet to change, which is a little bit outdated now, is the fact that they charge a $10 commission for every, every trade, regardless of the volume. So when you buy stocks, whether you buy 25 shares, 250 shares, 1,000 shares, you pay 10 bucks. But then when you sell them, you pay another 10 bucks. Um, most of the uh, online trading platforms right now are commission free. So this, this is a little bit outdated. Um, the money that they uh, hold, that 100000 from September 12th on, will earn uh, a little bit of a yield, 1%, uh, until they spend the money. So as it sits in their portfolio account, it earns 1%. Um, there is also the opportunity to borrow additional funds beyond 100000 This is called buying on margin. And in fact, because the margin requirement is 50%, meaning that uh, if you if you want to borrow money, you have to put down half of it out of your own assets, 50% down payment, and then the remaining 50% can be borrowed. So in theory, you have a, the kids have $100,000 in cash and then another $100,000 in, um, in margin uh, money, borrow money that they can borrow, credit. Uh, the, the problem though, is that you're going to pay an 8% interest rate. So if you buy stocks with borrowed money, uh, you have to, your, your stock has to appreciate by 8% before you can break even. So this can be risky. Um, quite obviously if the stock price falls, that 8% doesn't go away. Uh, and so the, it, the situation could be even worse. So, uh, it's not something that I really ever promoted. Uh, the kids, you know, but but the option is there. So there is the opportunity to buy on margin, per, to borrow an additional $100,000, but it comes at an 8% um, interest rate. Now, here is where the um, kind of the, the incentive, the invigoration, the motivation is to jump on the game immediately. Um, student teams must make three trades within the first four weeks. Uh, if if they don't, then the account will be deactivated. So if the game begins on September 12th, they have to October 7th to buy those uh, three uh, assets, okay, three stocks or, or bonds or mutual funds or index or a combination of all of them. Um, we want them to do that because, as I indicated before, you know, what's the point of doing this if you don't get into it? Um, failure to do that again can, can get you deactivated. Uh, the teams must have at least three investments, three assets in their account at the end of the game. Failure to do that disqualifies them from prize consideration. Okay. Um, in addition, because we don't want them to put all their eggs into one basket, the, the game requires or limits 
uh, investment of no more than 20% into any individual security. So if you have $100,000, you can't spend more than $20,000 on one stock, one company's stock. And um, the maximum that you can spend on any one investment is $25,000. So what that means, of course, 20%, uh, you know, 25,000 would be 20% 20 of 125,000. So if, you, if your portfolio has grown um, and you have made profits and now you have a, a sizable increase in your portfolio, you are still capped at 25,000 max on any individual investment. Again, to promote diversity, to avoid that one, you know, all eggs in one basket uh, situation that can be extremely risky. So again, this is a this is a game that is uh, fast paced. It is a game that still will reward the, the great risk taker uh, in terms of the prizes, but uh, the, the rules attempt to try to send the right messages in terms of investing. Um, we all, I'm sure, are familiar with the idea of buying low and selling high. Hopefully. Okay. You buy a stock at a low price and then hopefully watch it appreciate and sell it somewhere down the road. Okay, So that's called buying long. But you can also sell a stock short. You would sell a stock short if you expected the price of the stock to fall. So imagine if you got the idea to short sell Netflix right in the middle of COVID or short sell Peloton right in the middle of COVID. What you would do, I mean, the practice of short selling is that you borrow shares of stock from a broker, okay? Brokers oftentimes hold shares when people purchase them with margin accounts, with borrowed money. So they're holding the shares as, a, as collateral. So they, they can lend them to, they can lend them to um, a short seller. So you sell those borrowed shares at the current price, and then hopefully in the future, buy them back, which is called short covering, buy them back at a lower price. Keep the difference minus the $10 commission and give those shares back to the broker. Okay, so again, if you've watched the market, you know that Netflix took a dive when people all of a sudden emerged from COVID and began going outside and going to the movies again. Okay, a lot of people canceled their subscriptions. Um, Peloton, of course, um, has been widely documented in terms of its struggles. Um, so those would have been great stocks to short. Um, another rule is that we don't want kids to buy what, what are known as penny stocks. So typically a penny stock is something that sells at less than $5 a share uh, and has relatively small volume, which is the number of shares traded on any particular day. They're very risky and the game has chosen to uh, push the kids away from those stocks. So you can't buy a stock that's valued at less than $5 a share. Uh, I mean, you can, the stock could fall below $5 and you could buy it. Um, because you already own it, but you can't you can't venture into an investment at five dollars or or less, and you and you can only buy a stock if it has an actual volume uh, on on that day of at least ten thousand shares. Uh, all stocks must be bought in, in a minimum of twenty five shares. So you can't buy less than twenty five, and I know that it becomes somewhat of a challenge when you're buying you know Amazon or Berkshire Hathaway or something that, that is, um, sells in the thousands, Google, okay? So it makes it a little bit challenging uh, because you have those uh, you know, cap rules in terms of how much you can invest in any particular stock. You don't have to buy them in multiples of 25. Uh, you can buy 26 shares, you can buy 37 shares, uh, but you have to buy a minimum of 25. The margin requirement, as I said before, is 50%, so that does, afford you an additional $100,000 of credit, uh, but again, at 8%. And in order to avoid some type of boiler room remake where the kids are there smoking like, you know, three cigarettes at a time and drinking high powered coffee and, you know, uh, taking, uh, taking uh, caffeination pills uh, to try to keep up on investing, you know, buy, 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 buy. 
they put a cap on uh, the number of transactions in the 10 week period at a number that is far beyond the number that the kids will ever need. Uh, so that's 200 transactions, meaning 100 buys, 100 sells, okay, for instance. Um, but that is way more than they will ever use, way more. Um, as I indicated again, uh, and I'm, I'm saying this because I'm going to show you um, at the very end of this presentation, there's a, a project that I used over my many decades of playing the game, an assessment project that was a portfolio that the kids built. And it really, you know, was probably done with, with uh, you know, far more superior outcome when there was uh, kids working on it together. Um, but you can, if you choose to have teams that are greater than one person, you can divide the 100 grand up equally among each of the group members. You can, you can indicate to each group member, go out and spend the amount of money you have. If it's $333,000, then you, you, can, you buy the stocks that you want to buy, or I should say $33,000. You buy you know, two or three stocks that you want to buy. You buy two or three stocks that you want to buy. You buy two or three stocks that you want to buy in a group of three. And now all of a sudden you have six to nine stocks in a portfolio, possibly creating some diversity in that portfolio. And then when it's project time, you say, all right, you bought those two stocks. You do all the research. You find all the data. You do the background history on them. Okay. And then leave the individual student to pursue the information for the portfolio on the stocks that they purchased and then pull it all together into one portfolio and i'll show you some examples of that in in a minute all right so that is essentially the game now let's go back to the um florida sms site all right, i'm going to log in um, I have a little bit of a demo login here. Um, all right, so this is the instructor administration page. So this is where you will land when you establish your login credentials. Okay, and uh, this page, you know, we can see that the I'm speaking to you right now at about 11:45 in the morning, and Red is not good, and so the market is down currently. We can see not very much the Dow. Okay, so modestly down, basically flat at the moment. Um, this is the this is the page uh, you're going to establish on day one the number of teams that you believe you will need for the students that you have. I realize, of course, after the 11 day count. Class sizes might change. You may need new additional logins. So here you can get extra teams, extra logins, extra passwords if you need them. This is also the page as I scroll down where you can see, as I indicated, you will be able to monitor your students' activity. So you can see each of the stock accounts will be listed here. Uh, the activity that, that they have engaged in will be listed here. Again, you want to make sure this will be, you know, you'll, you'll have to check in periodically in the first four weeks to make sure that they are investing so that they don't get deactivated. Um, if you want, I'm going to show you some assignments that, that I'm going to present to you for your use. But if you want to, if you, um, if you hover a, a cursor over the word learning, you can see that there are a variety of different assignments that you can you can assign your students. If you want to utilize Stock Tracks Assignment Library, you can see that there are assignments uh, related to personal finance, investing, economics, business, terminology. Uh, you know, active assignments will be the ones that the kids are working on. Expired assignments, of course, will be the ones that have passed. But you may want to look at those for grading purposes. Uh, and then once you assign them, those assignments will show up uh, here. And again, you'll be able to observe whether your students are doing the assignments. So this this is kind of your overview page. This is the place that you go for um, for for the review of of the kids. And again, this is the instructor administration page. Now, um, to play the game, 
you are going to get your logins. You hopefully will have an opportunity before September 12th to let your kids practice. Then maybe let's say on a September 12th, the first day of the, of the competition, uh, you take your kids into a computer lab or you, or you utilize the, the uh, machine you have in your own room. And that will be the day in which kids can begin making trades. So you'll notice I'm hovering over the stock game. And if I drop into this menu, I can see I can buy stocks here. I can buy mutual funds here. I can buy bonds here. Uh, I can take a look at, it. again, this is for your students. Your students can take a look at their portfolio. They can see what stocks they currently have open and hopefully are profiting from. What are some of the positions that they've closed, maybe things that they've sold okay, uh, in the past. Uh, and of course, that's important when they're doing their project because you want them to report on the stocks, not only the stocks that are open, but ultimately what might have led them to sell a stock uh, at a particular point in the game. Uh, thus, the transaction history uh, and because it is competition, uh, where they rank, you know, where are they? What what place are they in in, in the game? So uh, this, what I'm showing you, yes, I am still on the uh, on the teacher page but this will be the same drop down menus that the students will have for the for themselves all right so on that september 12th day you may direct your kids to start buying things and um so let's say they want to buy a stock so click on that and it should take us to a transaction page all right so generally of course uh you're going to buy first Right. Again, you can short sell, I understand, but typically you're going to buy. So whatever action, if you click on this menu, buy low, sell high, short, which means borrow it and sell it high and hopefully cover it in the future low. Okay. In order to buy a stock, the students have to know the stock symbol. You'll notice down here at the bottom, there are some very popular stocks. And their symbols. So Apple is AAPL, Tesla is TSLA, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Nike, and so forth. Netflix, Disney, these are all wildly popular, broadly held stocks. Um, if if they are investing in this one of the stocks that aren't mentioned there, if they go up to this menu here and hover over investing research, then they can go to the symbol lookup right here symbol lookup and they will type in the company that they're looking for let's just say microsoft okay and click go and the symbol okay idiot um type in microsoft let's see this is this is not helpful me here. Um, all right, that's, uh, la, 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 let me try this again. Symbol look up, my bad. Okay, well, that's not very helpful. Um, because it's MSFT, but we're looking for that. Interesting. All right. So uh, as an alternative, because uh, this is kind of failing me. Um, I, 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 um, you may want to go to, I always send the kids as an alternative to, um, let me stop sharing for a moment. And I like going to um i'm going to open up a new window here and i like going to finance.yahoo.com okay which is also a great site the kids can go to review um if they type in hopefully this will work for me microsoft okay and there we go there's the symbol so um Better alternative, apparently too too questionable over there. So we, we want to avoid that. So pardon me for the um, the delay. 
All right, so I can, if I type in trade, if I wanna buy Microsoft, all of a sudden the symbol has been loaded for me. Now it's at this moment, down here you see that currently a share of Microsoft is $263 a share. Uh, it's having a good day. Green is good. It's up 75 cents. Um, the kids at this particular moment need to decide how much of their cash do they want to invest in this, realizing that they cannot spend more than 20% uh, of their cash. They can't spend more than, in this case, if they're starting out, they can't spend more than 20000 on it. So let's say they want to they want to spend ten thousand dollars. So ten thousand dollars is going to be approximately forty shares, let's say. And then they look over at this box, and they see immediately market. So this is an order type called a, a market order. And what that is saying is that whatever the price is, when you click that button, is the price that you're going to pay. So you're at the mercy of the supply and the demand of the marketplace, okay? Which is fine. You want the stock, you buy it, you place a market order, and you will get it very quickly, okay? With a very short delay. But let's say that they uh, have a revelation at two o'clock in the morning and they jump out of bed and they want to place an order because they know that come 9.30 in the morning, they'll be in English class and they won't be able to place an order buy a stock, they can actually, if you click the down menu, they can put in a limit order. And they can actually decide how much they want to spend. Okay, in other words, not be at the mercy, but say, all right, the I don't want to spend more than $263 per share. And that is going to be good for the entire trading day. So the only time that the order will be put through is if the price falls below 263. And at, at current point in the market, again, around noon, uh, we see that the price is going up. So if it stays above 263 all day, then the order will be um, negated. It won't, it won't happen. Um, so it is an opportunity to control to some degree how much you spend on, on shares. So market order is just take it for whatever the price is at the moment. Uh, limit order means that you are you're, you're setting parameters on how much you want to spend, on how much you want to spend. All right, so when, when the, um, so let's say I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy a market, so I'm gonna preview it. It tells me down here I'm going to spend approximately $10,578. I'm going to preview it to see if everything's good. Okay, buying 40 market, Microsoft, current price, paying that $10 commission, and I hit confirm one time. Okay, and it's sent there, and it should show up on my portfolio. Um, should show up on my portfolio. Again, it's delayed. Here's my portfolio. Uh, but lo and behold, I bought it. Okay, excellent. So it does, uh, it does show up quite quickly. Okay, my open positions, there it is, open. Okay, a um, little bit of a delay, again, as, as we said, 10 to 15 minutes, but within about 10 or 15 minutes, it will be there officially. All right, so um, again, down the road, if the kids wanna sell their Microsoft stock, sell their 40 shares, then they go back to this make a trade and they would put in sell and they would type in the symbol, the number of shares, and if the, again, if they don't care what price, then they can leave it as a market order. All right, so this is a fairly easy game to manipulate. Um, it, it will not challenge the students in order, you know, you know, who may struggle with technology. I mean, it's pretty straightforward where you find information uh, this is obviously the, the big the big uh, link that they want to drop into. 
because it'll show them their, their transactions, their history, how much cash they have, this is where they make trades. If they, if they have some questions, there are some tutorial videos here for them to, to review. So this is, this is great. Uh, they can do some investment research here. Um, and, uh, and so all of this is, like I said, it's pretty self-explanatory and won't be that challenging. All right, so let me show you now um, some resources that I have to offer you. And uh, I will, I will um, share, I can, if, if you, um, if you are watching this and you're interested in in accessing, getting access to this, these materials, uh, then you just send me a quick email and I will send you the link to, to the share drive, to the folder that um, houses all of these, all of these things. Um, so let's see, we're gonna go to the Google folder. Okay, and um, this, all of these resources in here are great. While I'm here, let me just point out a few things. Uh, I have put some NGPF assignments, some uh, next-gen personal finance assignments here that I think are really helpful. Uh, 25 things to know about investing by age 25. Here is a um, think pair share uh, form down here that the kids can, you know, what, what do I know? What am I kind of familiar with? What don't I know type of thing? Um, there is a, um, this is a fun little activity that you can do in class one day in which the kids are, uh, play the role of someone who's just purchased a, a new shares of a new company. Uh, but then things happen throughout a several week period and the kids have to make a decision whether they are going to buy more shares of it, sell it, hold, buy, sell, or hold whatever, and then they, then they will see the outcome, the impact that the, uh, that the storyline had on the price of the stock and whether they made a wise decision or not. Um, I have um, I put a, a, a video here on this activity, uh, the Stock Market Explained. It's a really great video, short five, six minutes or so with some assessment questions for the kids to answer. Okay, but um, for the purposes of, of this, I'm going to um, take you to a, another slide deck. And this is um, something that you'll, you'll probably have to use. I mean, there's no question that you're going to have to review what slides are and you're going to, uh, what slides are, what stocks are. Because again, you could be speaking to complete neophytes here when it comes to investing who don't have a clue about stocks. So this is a great slide deck to begin with um, to, to review what a stock is. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar, stocks, of course, are shares of ownership in a corporation. Uh, those shares become available to the public through what is known as an IPO. When a company goes public, in other words, it was privately held by the original founders and now They've decided that they want to uh, open up ownership to the general public for the purpose of raising funds, right? I mean, the main reason why a company goes public is because they want to accumulate the cash to expand their business, build more stores, broaden their horizon by diversifying their, uh, their reach. Um, and, and so an IPO is a big day for a company. Here's an example. Amazon's IPO was in 1997. That was the first logo uh, of the Amazon River, I guess, flowing through the letter A. Uh, the company, you may remember, if you're old enough to remember, when Amazon was purely a online book store. It was, the only thing that they sold were books. And so it was one of the, you know, but it, but it came out of the 90s, one of the original dot coms uh, and was a, a bookseller that was competing directly with Barnes and Noble and, 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 you know, other obviously small mom and pop bookstores and, you know, served to be an annoyance to those companies. The 
opening price for a share was $18 for Amazon. Amazon, uh, you know, when, when a company wants to go public, they contract with what is called an investment banker. And an investment banker helps them decide, among other things, what, you know, where are their shares properly priced? Okay, it, it's clearly going to have a lot to do with how much money they want to raise, but it's also, you know, where is the market? You know, where are like companies located? Um, so the IPO price is, um, comes as a result of a lot of research, a lot of collaboration between the company and the investment bankers to support them. So $18 was the opening price. The, on that day, I, the IPO, so uh, they, they raised $54 million. So if you divide $54 million by $18, you can determine exactly the number of shares that they sold on that day. And um, it ultimately resulted in the company having a market value of $438 million. Mark, the market cap represents the price of a share times the number of shares. So um, at the end of that day, don't know exactly what happened. I'm sure the stock probably went up, but the opening price at 9:30 was 18. Maybe by the end of the day it was higher, but by the end of the day, the the company was worth about 438 million dollars, which you know it's not that's not chicken feed. Today though, whole other story. Oh yeah, 256 employees at that time. Okay, I mean, how many employees do you need for a company that has no physical presence, right? So it was a small company with very limited number of employees. Today, another story. Here's just a small slice of some of the acquisitions that Amazon has made in recent years. Okay, we also know, of course, all of the different markets now that they are attempting to conquer. Okay, I mean, they're sending rockets into outer space. They are, of course, uh, probably attached to the doorbell on your house with Ring security services. Uh, they, uh, of course, are in the, in the process of, um, of, of creating autonomous vehicles. Um, they want to be your grocery store. They want to be your healthcare option. Okay, they, they obviously they have prime video and all of that content. Okay, I mean, they're winning Emmy awards now for their television programming, streaming programming. So, I mean, they have become the, uh, the, the one-stop shop for most everything that we want. But as you might imagine, their value is a little bit higher. Yes, they're worth about 1.7 trillion today. Uh, the share price in recent times has been over 3,000 a share. They have one and a third million employees. And again, as I indicated, can you think of a, of a spot in your life that Amazon has not ventured into? Okay, it's, it'll be, it would be a challenge. Great to be the king. Stock trading, of course. Traditionally, we, we envision people dressed in wild colored jackets on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, screaming and yelling, little pieces of paper like confetti flying all over the place. Uh, and that, that, of course, is an antiquated vision because most stocks nowadays are traded online, they're traded electronically. Uh, many of us, of course, you know, my, my parents, my grandparents would go to a stock broker sit down with a full service brokerage firm pay exorbitant fees to have them tell you what to do with your money well nowadays of course many of us are independent we do our own research we trade on commission free trading platforms uh and um and again it's rare to see any kind of trading done face to face face to face here are some of the traditional stock exchanges um, down in uh, lower Manhattan. Here we see that by no means is stock trading exclusively an American activity. It, it happens around the world. So here are some ex stock exchanges in different parts of the world. Um, what this segment of, this, of the um, slide deck talks about are some of the different identities of stocks. Uh, a growth stock, I alluded to this earlier, where, you know, you're young, you find this, this company that you really like, okay, they're a, a fledgling new newbie company just on the horizon. 
Uh, you buy it at a really cheap price. Okay? I mean, think about Amazon in 1997. That's kind of where they were. So uh, you, you know, if you if, if you were around in 1997 and had the foresight to buy the Amazon IPO, you would be one happy clam uh, because the stock would have appreciated with, over over that time. You know, more multiples than we could possibly imagine. And why is that? Because the company earned money, it reinvested it, it grew, it expanded, it broadened its horizons, it broadens its markets and its reach around the globe. And now the stock is an unbelievable success. So here are some examples, as you can see, Amazon being one, Google, Netflix, uh, Salesforce, Etsy. These are all companies that earn money and then reinvest their profits back into the company to expand the markets, to expand their reach. On the other hand, in income stock, and I was alluding to this earlier when we were talking about passive income streams, uh, a, a income stock, instead of reinvesting all the profits back into the company, will share some of the profits with the shareholders through what is called a dividend. And these tend to be companies, as I indicated at the bottom of the slide, that are established, they tend to specialize in one thing, they tend to produce uh, a, a commodity or an item or a service that people need, okay? uh, and therefore they have a wide moat in terms of competition and, and, and strength in terms of market share. Uh, and those are the types of companies that typically, typically pay dividends. Here are some examples. Most of these are household name companies. But this particular group is special because it is a, these are all dividend champions. And they are companies that have increased their dividends for more than 50 years straight. Now think about what's happened in this country economically over the last 50 years. The highs, the lows, the crashes, uh, the challenges that, to our marketplaces, but these companies have been unfazed. They have continuously paid uh, a dividend and, more importantly, grown the dividend over time. Okay, Because paying a, a dividend that doesn't grow means that it won't keep up with inflation. So each one of these are companies. Thus, you know, I mean, uh, is Coca-Cola going to be gone in, I mean, I can see Coca-Cola machines on Mars, right? Um, you know, Target. Shopping on, uh, you know, the targets, the Target Meteor store. <laughs> I mean, these are all companies that produce things that we need. Produce thing again have very little competition in what they do, and so why not invest in these? You know, put your head down, forget about what's happening in terms of volatility in the marketplace, and just continue to plunk money into these companies as they grow their dividends and create a nice income stream. Uh, over your lifetime. Defensive stocks are companies that produce things that uh, we will tend to always buy regardless of the fluctuation of the economy. You know, I can never imagine me saying, oh, I just lost my job, I guess I have to give up ketchup or cereal or my Pepsi, or I'm going to stop brushing my teeth. So these are companies that tend to uh, stand up well when the economy uh, declines, when there's a contraction versus cyclical stocks that tend to follow the same fluctuation pattern of the economy. They do really well when the economy is doing well, right? Because people tend not to buy cars when they are struggling, uh, when they fear for their own uh, personal financial situation, or they tend not to travel, tend not to buy new homes. Companies tend not to make big investments into huge yellow earth moving equipment. So, but, you know, as, as the economy emerges from uh, a contraction, not a bad time to start buying these stocks. So it, in this case, it's all about timing. You've probably heard of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. You've probably heard some newscasters say at some point in your life, the Dow is up, the Dow is down. Okay, well, the Dow is comprised of these 30 companies. And the, Dow, these, the, the, the membership in this group does change over time. If I were to show you the Dow Jones Industrial Companies over the last 100 years, they would be somewhat of a reflection of the focus of our economy. 
when we were a big, uh, you know, smokestack, factory-oriented, industrial economy, the Dow was dominated by those things. Today, of course, we are a consumer economy. Okay? We are an economy that, we, we are a people that, uh, you know, have a wide array of maladies. So we've got a lot of pharmaceutical companies on here. We, we're, we've got, a, you know, technology is such a big part of our lives. Uh, notice there is not a car company uh, on this group, in this group, okay? Of course, back in the 1950s, dominated several car companies. So it is a reflection to some degree. Uh, it is the most renowned and trusted of all of the indexes. Again, people know, if, if there's one thing you know about the stock market, it's probably you've heard the term the Dow. Problem though, is that it's it's only 30 companies. I mean, I, I like to equate this to um, to the sampling that uh, network television does to determine what is the number one show on Tuesday nights. Okay, do they ask every television viewer what they were watching on Tuesday nights? No, they will poll about a thousand people. They will make sure that that thousand is a good representation of the American demographic, the American public. Okay. Uh, in other words, people from all different regions, different ages, different genders, different income levels, different races and creeds and religions uh, to try to get a paint a microcosm of the United States of America. And then they will determine from that group what they watch and then that, that will extrapolate to be the number for the entire country. Okay. This is a small group of 30. But by no means is this a cross section. These are all big companies. It ignores medium sized companies, small companies. Okay? Uh, and therefore, this is not a, even though it is renowned and it is quoted every day, it's not a particularly good index. Okay? It's not a good survey of how the, the market as a whole is doing. Thus, a better one is the SP 500. And uh, Standard & Poor's 500 is, by the name, 500 companies. It also includes small companies, big companies, medium-sized companies, and it includes companies across 11 sectors of the economy. Okay, so a broad market view, uh, different sizes, so a much better reflection of, you know, corporate America. Uh, you know, what our economy is truly about, because by no means are we simply a lot of big companies. We have different size companies. All right. So uh, I'm going to jump from the slide deck right now, and I'm going to take you to one of the activities uh, in the folder that I'm going to share with you. And this, uh, you can see S&P 500 right here. This uh, is this is a uh, activity that, and here's the answer key down here for you. So all the answers are, are provided here. Tracking stock, market performance, tracking stocks, answer sheet right here. I'm gonna click this open. And um, this, is a, this is a Google form. Thus, it affords you a paperless option when assigning it to your students. Uh, you can email it to them. They can answer their the questions right on the form, and then they can send it back to you for assessment. You will notice that it is uh, a colorful uh, activity, okay? Um, asking some simple questions, using some graphs to show market volatility, okay? But also, of course, the idea that the market has a track record of recovering from its dips. Okay, it takes a look at a quilt that gives you a vision of all of the different sectors of the S&P 500 and how they performed. Okay, um, it is something that also cites, you hit the, a couple of these um, links, takes you to different graphics that, that the kids will be asked to, uh, to assess, to observe, and to answer questions about. But for the purposes of my little presentation here, I'm just gonna focus on this map right here. And I'm going to just, I'm gonna 
make sure that you see this. So I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. I'm going to share, open this again. And I'm going to open a new window and I'm going to plop it in. And let's see if it works. Yes, it does. I hope it does. Okay, hopefully you are looking. And then I just wanted to make sure because I think there was a little bit of a problem when I did this presentation the other day. So I want to make sure that everybody is seeing this. Okay, if you hit that link on the Google form, <coughs> you'll be taken to this map. I, I love this map. This is all of the 500 companies in the S&P 500. Okay, notice that the majority of them are a greenish hue, to some degrees bright and to some degree somewhat muted. But anything green means that the stock is currently up. So Meta, which you may know is uh, formerly known as Facebook, is having a really good day. Look at that, I hovered over it and it tells me that the stock is up four and a half percent today. Uh, Google is up a little bit more modestly at about three quarters of a percent. Amazon is, is about flat. Okay, over here we see Walmart and Coca-Cola and Pepsi okay, and um, Monster Beverage. Okay, um, down here we see Procter & Gamble, which of course they make your, you know, shampoos and your laundry detergents and things like that. Over here are the oil companies, Exxon Mobil. Um, here we see pharmaceutical companies, Johnson & Johnson, Eli Lilly, Pfizer. Over here are the tech companies, Microsoft, Apple, okay, financial companies like Visa, MasterCard, American Express. Uh, this, this whole map is divided into 11 different sectors. Here's your healthcare down here. Okay, uh, here is your insurance down here at the bottom. Basic materials, okay, um, which are things like chemicals and uh, raw materials that you would use in an in industry. Um, utility companies, big energy companies like that provide us with with our like electricity, like Duke Energy, Southern Company, Next Era Energy, which is the parent firm of FPNL. Okay, give you an idea. Uh, and here, over here, we see um, Kraft Heinz. So th these are the folks that make your mac and cheese and your ketchup. Here is Kellogg cereal. Okay, here is your your cigarette companies: Philip Morris, uh, Altria, uh, Hershey. Okay, um, and so this map's great. Thus. This is showing current, like I said, it's about 1220 right now in the afternoon. So this is what the market has done today since 930. It's opening. If you want to take a look at a longer time period, hit this down drop menu and you can change the parameters. So let's say what's the market done over the last year? Mm, been a down year for some, not for oil companies. Look at, you know. Price of oil was pushing towards and maybe even beyond five bucks a gallon. Look at what that did for Exxon Mobil. I mean, Exxon Mobil stock is up 75%. Okay, so the energy sector did really well. Healthcare sector did really well, COVID and all that, right? Um, technology, not so well, right? Um, when you take a look at the companies that provide us with tech, uh, you know, and streaming, uh, you know, um, they didn't do particularly well. All right, um, so you can you can get a sense as to where the market has been, uh, what it's doing currently. All right, so if you you'll notice if if you hover over any one of these, uh, the price should pop up. I think. Okay, um, no, it's frozen. All right, so um, one of the questions here, this is a company called Yum Brands. So, you know, we've heard, of, we, we know what McDonald's is, we know what Chipotle is, we know what Starbucks is, but Yum Brands, so I asked the kids, and one of the questions on the form, I, you know, click on it, double click, and we will see um, a, a big information page opening up for Yum Brands. 
And we can see that Yum Brands has had a little bit of difficulty. It's not had been a particularly good year. There was a time when Yum was trading at about 139. It's about 110 now. So it's had a down year like many companies. Um, but you may scratch your head. We can see that it's in the restaurant um, sector of the economy. It's considered consumer cyclical, which makes sense because people tend to not eat out during certain times, whether they be financial trouble or COVID. So, um, so these are these are definitely uh, sit down restaurants, okay, or at least takeout restaurants. And so we scroll down and we you know take a look at a lot of information, and, and here it describes what Yum Brands is. And lo and behold, it's the parent firm for very familiar restaurant chains like KFC, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell. All right, so you can imagine again that these companies are just kind of emerging now. Uh, these are companies that really do well when, when people are spending money freely and of course feel comfortable in venturing out into public. And therefore they're not gonna do particularly well when, when there's um, a downturn in the economy, which is kind of where we are right now. Okay, we're, we're in a questionable whether we're in the midst of a recession or not, but um, recessions, there's been a contraction in spending, no doubt about it. And people cut back on these types of things first in their budget. So um, if we go back to the uh, questions, I asked the kids to take a look at that big full quilted map uh, and respond to some questions related to that. Uh, then I ask here in question four, I asked the kids to focus in on Yum Brands okay, and, do, and, and, and write down what franchises make up Yum Brands. So they would type in Kentucky Fried Chicken and Pizza Hut and, and all of that. And then um, do what I just did in terms of changing the parameters, the date parameters from that single day to one year, and then write down what they observe from that, okay? And uh, making some observations in terms of in that one year period, which sectors seem to have the worst performance, okay? Uh, and there are four choices, so make that decision. And then, um, you know, so, as I said, interpret graphs, interpret other diagrams. So this is a great way to introduce the kids to some wonderful resources that they can use in their own uh, stock investment research, but also to give them a kind of a good understanding of the scope of the market, you know, and, and, and the breadth of the marketplace. So that is a great assignment to, uh, to work on. All right. Um, let me just go back real quickly as I begin to wrap things up here. The um, Going back to the drive that I'm gonna share, the drive folder that I can share with you. I indicated at the very beginning that I, I do a, when I was teaching and I was doing the stock market challenge, uh, to assess you know, whether the kids got it, I would have them do an end of the simulation project, this, the assessment project. And, um, it is a opportunity for either the individual to kind of review what they bought, why they bought it, how it did while they held on to it, what might have led them to sell it, to do some research on the history of the company, what is the company's competition, what kind of market share does it have, uh, what are some of the challenges that the company faces um, in, in the future. Uh, you know, so basically give me an overview of the companies that they invested in. If you have two or three kids in a group, then as I indicated, they can research the stocks that they bought and then the project can be pulled together as a culmination of the three individuals uh, activity, the three individuals work. This can be presented through a slide deck and I have that all, all these suggestions here. It can be presented through a hyperdoc, it can be presented through a website that they build. It can also be something physical like a three ring loose leaf notebook, a scrapbook, a magazine, a storybook. Uh, the sky's the limit. You want the kids to be creative. You want it to be colorful. You want it to be uh, humorous. You want it maybe to be a little self deprecating if they don't do particularly well. Uh, you want it to be very um, rich in data and, and graphs and charts to show how the stock did uh, and maybe the history of the stock performance okay and um, 
ultimately, this is a great way to assess whether they uh, whether whether they got it. Did they get into it? Did they enjoy it? Did they did they play the game? And did it make a lasting impression? Um, I have a couple examples here that I will share with you if you if you do contact me and ask me for the drive. Um, and both of these are slide decks that go through the companies that that uh, these kids. When I was collecting the projects, I just pulled out two samples that the, uh, they did a research project on the on the portfolio that they had purchased. All right, so. Um, I'm going to wrap it up there. I strongly, strongly endorse this game. I think it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic way to teach about markets. It's a fantastic way to get kids excited about investing. As I indicated to you at the very top, uh, the countless number of kids that have chased me down over the years to ask me, how do I really do this? I really want to get into this. Um, so please take advantage of of the uh, of of this um, of this wonderful simulation. All right. So with that, I will bid you adieu. And again, please um, please do contact me with any questions or with, of course, interest in accessing that folder. Take care.